So great to see all of you um, on this chilly evening. So I'd like to tell you about unsolved mysteries of fundamental physics. Um, there's been a lot of talk lately about problems facing physics, where we'll go next, and so on. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about, about that stuff. I want to keep it extremely non-technical. Uh, so first, I have to tell you, what does fundamental physics mean? It could mean all sorts of things. But often, among physicists, it means something rather specific. <clears throat> you could actually have a whole hour-long talk discussing what it means, but I'll try to not do that. Uh, so what I mean is a search for a small set of laws which, in principle, determine everything that we can calculate mathematically about the universe. So every single word in there is like short for like a long discussion. For example, the in principle part is very important because even if you have some laws, some equations that determine what will happen in the situation, it could be, and in fact, it typically is extremely computationally difficult to derive the consequences of those laws. So for example, even if you could predict the weather using the equations we have for how air flows, we know that small errors build up and so that in practice, predicting the weather for more than a couple of weeks is impossible because you'd need to know where every air molecule was exactly right now. Also, there's a lot of stuff that we can't calculate about the universe, apparently. For example, quantum mechanics says that there are measurements you can do where the result is random. We cannot predict what will happen when we measure those things. Uh, and so we just give up on that. At best, we predict probabilities of measuring certain things. So there are a lot of limitations to what you could do uh, with you, if you had these laws of the universe that fundamental physics is after, but that's what fundamental physics is about. Now, by 1980, we had one equation that could do a pretty good job of handling the fundamental physics that applies here on Earth. I'm not trying to get you to understand this equation. This equation here is purely to impress you. Um, <laughs> really glad to know. Um, um, but it, it's, the, it's meant to, first of all, impress you of the idea of this dream of like a little equation that you could write on a postcard that would be the laws of physics. So you can see uh, that this somehow is supposed to cover quantum mechanics, the structure of space time, the force of gravity, the other forces of nature, the matter, and the last mysterious uh, link, the Higgs boson, which gives matter its mass. This is sort of bolting together the theory of gravity and the theory of other forces in an ad hoc way, which is definitely not the last uh, word on the subject, but it's pretty darn good in practice. Um, however, already by uh, sorry. already by 1980, some cracks in this edifice were visible, and I'll tell you more about them because that's the exciting stuff. And some of them were fixed since then, but others have widened and gotten more apparent since then. Um, and indeed. Theoretical physics has not managed to fill those cracks or to heal the division between gravity and the other forces, despite a huge amount of work among theorists uh, attempting to do that. And so some books have started to come out. These are all pretty written by friends of mine, actually, uh, bemoaning the progress, bemoaning the lack of progress in fundamental physics and suggesting some possible things that physicists should do uh, differently to solve those problems. Now, I'm not going to suggest anything that physicists should do to do things better, because I don't really think I know. Uh, but I wanted to point out that, that this is a brewing uh, debate now as to whether physicists are doing something wrong or whether they're doing the best they can or what. Um, sorry, this. What should I be pointing out? Yeah. Not me. Not you. <laughs> uh, oh, I understand. I'm being stupid. Okay. Um, so some have even gone so far as to predict the end of science um, in big, bold faced letters. But that's going way too far. For one thing, fundamental physics is just a small part of physics as a whole. Most of what physicists do is use the fundamental laws of physics to actually predict things 
that are going to happen and to like devise new forms of matter and new kinds of tricks you can do using the laws of physics. Uh, so even if fundamental physics is stuck, physics is definitely not stuck. Uh, and physics is just a tiny small part of science. By now, biology is a much more active branch of science than physics, for example. And science itself, I'd say, is really just getting started. There's so many open scientific questions that I believe can be solved and are being solved that it's ridiculous to talk about the end of science now, unless, of course, you think that global warming or artificial intelligence or something will destroy our civilization. So I think the only thing we have to worry about when it comes to the end of science is that, keeping our civilization going. Um, but I'm really doing a bad job of this, I'll catch on. And indeed, the great thing about fundamental physics is that it's the exact opposite of urgent. It will wait. The laws of physics are not like twiddling your thumbs, getting restless. Um, and indeed, there are, if you're an ambitious, young person or even an ambitious old person, there are many urgent problems that we really need to solve much more than figuring out the fundamental laws of physics. This is some little graph of different possible uh, things that could happen with global warming. And you notice that the best outcomes involve going down very low carbon emissions, in fact, getting negative carbon emissions, something that we really don't know how to do at the scale necessary. So there are just tons of things we should be doing that are much more urgent than figuring out the final laws of physics. Um, and I should say, there's also lots of great non-fundamental physics to do. If you just want to do physics, there's no shortage of really cool things to do. For example, we now can make forms of matter, which in that matter seem to have two different dimensions of time instead of the usual one dimension of time. We can make forms of light where light combines with matter and forms a liquid. You can do all sorts of crazy things and, and people are doing these, coming up with more and more ideas, none of which involve any new fundamental physics. They all involve exploiting the laws of physics that we already have. So we don't need to worry about the, taking time to figure out the last uh, steps in the great chain of the laws of physics. But still, fundamental physics is interesting, and that's what I've gathered you here to listen about. So I'm going to talk about that. So what do we know about fundamental physics, and what are the mysteries? Of course, the most fundamental mystery of all is why? That's the question that every child has. And if you've ever had a child, or perhaps been one, you'll know that any answer to such a question begets another such question in an annoying sequence. Um, now, of course, some people love to tell you that science does not tell you why things happen, just what happens, or maybe how they happen. There's definitely a lot of truth to that. And yet, I think it's really important not to underrate the importance of why questions, because that's often how science moves forward, by asking why. So maybe science never answers why, but, it, but they definitely <laughs> ask why. So let me just give you an example. Why is the sky blue? That's a question that a lot of people have had. Um, so one answer. Well, more than light of other colors, blue light is scattered in all directions by the Earth's atmosphere. So light coming from the sun will hit the Earth's atmosphere, and the bluer light gets scattered more, so the sky that's not right next to the sun looks mainly blue. Good, there's an answer. But why is blue light scattered more? Well, because blue light has a shorter wavelength than most other visible light. Well, that begs other questions. So like, well, lots of other questions. One, why does blue light have a shorter wavelength? Well, the answer to this is not so satisfying. No reason, we just call visible light that has short wavelengths blue, or if it's even shorter wavelength, violet. Uh, but why does light with short wavelengths look blue? Uh, well, this physicist will say, that's not a physics question. Go ask someone else, uh, like maybe a philosopher or a psychologist or a neurophysiologist, you know, the question of like, whether all of us looking at this see the same blue is a very difficult question. And physicists have wisely managed to get out of the business of answering <laughs> those kinds of questions. 
Um, okay, okay. So why does light with short wavelengths scatter more? Well, the answer is it's a general fact, a very general fact that almost any sort of wave scatters off small particles with an intensity that's bigger when the wavelength is shorter. In fact, there's a formula for it. The intensity of scattering is proportional to one over the wavelength to the fourth power. So when you have very short wavelengths of light, they scatter more. Well, this of course would instantly make any child ask another question. Uh, so, like, why one over the wavelength to the fourth power? Where did, the heck did that come from? <laughs> and now that now physicists are very happy to answer questions like that. Uh, so that's a good question. They would say, I, "I'm not going to give you the calculation here, but a physicist named Lord Raleigh showed this in 1871, and it relies, interestingly, on the fact that space has three dimensions. There are three directions here, and the fact that the the number when you do the calculation, the number four here is coming because it's three plus one. You have to do a kind of calculation to see that. It's not at all obvious, but it's really fun. Uh, and it turns out if space were two dimensional, if we were like flatlanders living on a two dimensional universe, then the intensity would go like one over wavelength q. So, so there's something really interesting there. Uh, that, that could be a whole lecture on its on its own. Um, but then the child asks, well, why is space three-dimensional? <laughs> oh, wow. So now that's a good physics question, but nobody knows is the short answer. No one knows. That's just way too hard for us right now. So in fact, there are lots of really good sounding questions of physics that are just too hard for us right now. And basically part of learning physics, especially if you're going into this fundamental physics, is like learning everything that people know about these questions. Uh, which is not nothing, but it's sort of not for an answer. So why is space three-dimensional? Nobody knows. Why is time one-dimensional? You may never have even thought of two-dimensional time, but as I said, we can make materials now in which time acts two-dimensional. We don't know why time is one-dimensional. Um, there are broader questions like, are there any truly fundamental laws? I mean, here you are talking about these fundamental laws, but how do you even know that there are any? Uh, or could it be that there's just a succession of ever better and better approximate laws? So like, you know, it could be like in 5 billion years from now, we're still studying physics and we're saying like, we've got much better laws than we did like 2 billion years ago, but we still don't quite know what's going on. We don't know. We have no idea if that's going to be how it plays out, assuming, of course, that civilization survives so that we don't have the luxury of, of worrying about such things. Um, and then, of course, the question, if fundamental laws exist, what are they? Well, we just don't know, we don't know. That's what physicists would love to know. But the, it's important to realize also that some questions that look like they're way too hard to answer actually were answered. So sometimes you can be positively surprised in this business. For example, why is time so different from space? That sounds just as imponderable and difficult as the ones on the last slide, but it turns out that there's an answer it's because there's a formula for the distance between two points in space time. So space time is four dimensional and it has three dimensions of space, which we usually call X, <laughs> Y, and Z, and one coordinate of time called T. And there's a formula for the distance between two points in space time that depends on the change in the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, the Z coordinate, and the T coordinate. And you'll notice that the space guys have plus signs in front of them, but the time shows up with a minus sign. If you've ever studied the Pythagorean formula, you know that like the hypotenuse is the sum of the squares of the of these two sides. This is sort of like that, but you've got like three sides that are that are like the space and one that's time, and the time one is different. So it turns out amazingly that that little minus sign there explains practically all the difference between space and time. That just one little thing is enough to cause the difference. And this is basically the idea behind Einstein's theory of special relativity. He realized that all sorts of wonderful things follow from positing this formula. So we now feel like we do know a lot more about why time is different than space. So it's really hard to guess which questions we're going to answer and which ones will be sort of forever and vulnerable, or maybe just 
ponderable for like a million years. Uh, but it helps anyway to know where we stand now. So I'd like to give you a little quick overview of what we know about physics. It's going to be very non-technical, so it will be non-quantitative. So it means I can't like really, really, really tell you where we are, but just sort of outline it. So these are our best theories of fundamental physics today. Strangely, we don't really have one. We've got two. One is called the standard model, and it covers all three forces except gravity. There's the electromagnetic force. So everything about electricity and magnetism and light is, is the electromagnetic force. The, the forces that, are, that you notice when you study nuclei of atoms are the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force. There are two. Uh, and these are all covered by the standard model. And these are described using quantum mechanics, which I won't say much about, but it's really important because general relativity is our theory of the other force, gravity. And that is not described currently using quantum mechanics. That does not fit in. Um, so, so, so there's the split in our understanding of the world where, where these first three forces we understand in one theory and the other in the other theory, and we can't really fit them together. Although in that first slide where I showed you that very impressive formula, they were sort of slapped together in a way which is sort of good enough for government work. Um, now the standard model describes both matter and forces using quantum mechanics. So there are particles that constitute matter, like electrons, which are these little guys labeled E minus, who are negatively charged. And there are particles that describe forces, like the electromagnetic force. The electromagnetic force is carried by particles called photons, which are drawn in this cute wiggly way here. Gamma is a name for a photon. And what the standard model gives you is a bunch of formulas for calculating the probabilities that various events will occur when you smack particles into each other. So this little picture is a, is a kind of a symbolic diagram of two electrons coming in. They, they're both negatively charged and they repel each other. And the way they do it is they exchange a photon and then they push away from each other and, and go out. But because it's described using quantum mechanics, we don't know for sure how they will shoot out. We just know the probability they will, that they will shoot out with various different possible velocities. And the standard model gives you formulas that lets you calculate those probabilities, both for this particular force that involves the photon and the other forces that uh, show up in the standard model and for other particles besides electrons. But interestingly, both matter and forces are described by different kinds of particles. So here are all the particles in the standard model. So these, there are particles that carry forces. So there's the electromagnetic force, the weak force, and the strong force. And each of one, them has one or, or more particles that carry it, some with very cute names. Uh, and then there are particles that constitute matter. Matter, strangely, comes in three generations. The first generation includes all the matter that you see around us here, for the most part. Namely, um, there are electrons. So our, at our atoms are full of electrons. Now, our atoms also have protons and neutrons in them, too. Those are the main other things you think about when you think about atoms. Uh, but those protons and neutrons are, have smaller constituents that have been discovered called quarks. And they're just called the down and the up quark. Uh, and then there's a ghostly counterpart of the electron called the electron neutrino. That's this nu sub e guy. And that's a neutral particle, as the name indicates. And neutrinos, I call them ghostly because they're extremely hard to detect. They only interact with things via the weak force, which is weak. So they're very hard to catch. Now, the strange thing is that in addition to those, there are sort of copies of them called the second generation consisting of some other particles that are heavier, and then some in the third generation, which are still heavier. 
But these other guys tend to decay very rapidly into particles of the first generation. So they don't hang around. So they're particles that you pretty much only see uh, when you have very energetic cosmic rays shooting down from, from the heavens, from various energetic events occurring stars and so on, or you make them yourselves using particle accelerators. And that's what people do with particle accelerators is, is, is create and study these uh, more exotic particles. And then finally, there's one more that you've probably heard of called the Higgs boson, which interacts with all the particles that have mass and its interaction with those particles is what gives them mass. Um, and so you could draw a little chart of all these particles and how they interact with each other or which ones interact with each other, I should just say. So the blue curves here are just ways of indicating that one particle does interact, that does do something and it bounces into another particle. So for example, the Higgs boson interacts with lots of different particles uh, because lots of particles have mass. It does not interact with the photon because the photon has zero mass. Light is light. It doesn't have any mass. Um, uh, the Higgs boson interacts with itself uh, because it has mass and, and so on. So like the photon does interact with the electron as I showed you in that earlier slide and it interacts with the, the electrons uh, partner particles of the second and third generation, but it does not interact with the neutrinos, of which there are also three, because those are electrically neutral, and so on. So it's a rather complicated pattern. It's not anything that anyone would have decided, like, okay, let's make up a theory of physics. Hey, I'm going to try this. That's not how it goes. It's just you do experiments and you discover that there's all this stuff going on and you have to account for it. Um, so it's to make quantitative predictions, of course, you need numbers. And so, in fact, there are 25 numbers in the standard model of physics, which describe the precise strength of the various interactions that are involved. Uh, and surprisingly, 22 of them, a lot of them, involve the Higgs boson. That is because the Higgs boson is, is interacting with lots of things, giving them their mass, and also doing some other things like uh, perhaps, uh, and I'm assuming it's true here, uh, making the neutrinos do extra stuff called oscillate. So there are these 25 numbers that we don't know how to calculate from first principles. The only way we can figure out these numbers is by actually doing experiments in the lab. And that's part of the standard model, just this list of numbers. So having heard this, you should, unless, you, unless you're extremely jaded, you should be bursting with questions like, you know, what's going on with all this stuff? Uh, so here are a few of the obvious questions that might immediately leap to mind. Like, why are there three forces in the standard model? Why not just one? Wouldn't that be simpler? Or maybe like 17, if you really want to make it exciting. Why are, why are there three? Why does each generation of particles have two leptons and two quarks in it? There's some kind of weird pattern there, but we don't. We don't, we don't know really why. Why are there three generations of particles? We're pretty sure that that's true because we we can do experiments smacking some particles into others where like particles of every generation are getting created. So unless the remaining generations of particles are extraordinarily heavy, uh, we know for sure that there are just three by, uh, so, but we don't know why. And then of course, why did the 25 numbers that I alluded to have the values that they do. So now there are some theories, so-called grand unified theories, people making these theories are not extremely modest, uh, <laughs> who offer plausible answers to the first two questions. There's, for example, a theory called the SO10 grand unified theory, which shows you that like, yes, everything is beautiful in this theory, but only if you have three forces and only if each generation has two leptons and two quarks and so on and so on. It's really great, it's really beautiful. Um, we're not sure that that theory is true, but it's, it's, it's really interesting because of how it seems to make sense out of this mess of information. Um, the third question, why are there are three generations of matter particles, we're really much more clueless about that. 
And the fourth one, why do these numbers take the values they do? We're like completely clueless about that. People do try to make up formulas for these numbers, uh, but none of them seem very convincing. We just don't know a mechanism whereby these numbers would arise. Well, there are, I mean, we, people have theories of mechanisms whereby they arise, but none of them are extraordinarily convincing. So it's, a, it's difficult. So instead of doing things that like are obvious to try to do, but seem impossible, people work on things that are less obvious, but where you actually have a chance to make some progress. So let me tell you some questions that are like more like the questions that people can actually get a grip on and do something with, in particular with experiments. Um, so as I've said, since 1980, theorists have not been in general ahead of the curve predicting things that experimentalists later on discovered. In general, what's been going on is that experimentalists have been finding new things uh, and theorists are, are grappling with those. So once upon a time, uh, like in the early 80s, there's, we, in the original version of the standard model, it was thought that neutrinos were massless. They had no mass at all. Now we know that they have masses, very tiny masses, but masses nonetheless. And we also know that the three different kinds of neutrinos can turn into each other. Actually, the first hints of this came, I think already back in the 1960s, when they started measuring how many electron neutrinos were coming out of the sun. The fusion reaction in the, that powers the sun produces electron neutrinos, like electron anti-neutrinos. Uh, and you could guess how many should be coming out. And they discovered that about one third as much were detected as they thought should be detected. Uh, and we now know that's because the neutrinos coming out of the sun turn into the other kinds of neutrinos and there are three different kinds. And so neutrinos will, if they whiz along, they'll oscillate between being one kind and another kind. Uh, and so now that we know this through many very difficult experiments, people were able to fix the standard model. It just turned out to be a pretty easy and natural fix to do, uh, basically by saying that neutrinos are more like the, uh, the, the, the neutrinos are more like the quarks than, than had originally been thought. And so now we uh, say the neutrinos like the quarks interact with the Higgs boson. So they do have mass and turn into each other. So it turns out that now seven of the 25 numbers in the standard model provide the details of how neutrinos act. But we're still not completely sure this theory is right. People keep on doing experiments with neutrinos that are very hard, and sometimes they seem to not fit into this new improved version of the standard model. So for example, here's an experiment uh, jokingly called mini boon, which consists of 800 tons of mineral oil uh, in a tank that looks like that, uh, bombarded with new muon neutrinos from a particle accelerator from a distance of 500 meters away. And they've been running, they ran the experiment for 16 years because neutrinos are incredibly hard to detect. So every so often a neutrino will hit a molecule in that big tank and it'll make a little spark and all these little uh, light detectors, which are these, uh, these little yellow blobs here, will, will detect the spark and, and they'll estimate things like how fast the neutrino is going and stuff like that. And what they discovered, which is seemed to be going along with another surprising experiment, was that the mu muon neutrinos produced by the particle accelerator seem to be turning into electron mu neutrinos before they hit this tank. And they seem to be doing it too fast to fit the standard model. So people were getting very excited at that time, thinking like, wow, okay, so the standard model is not adequately predicting the properties of electron neutrinos or of neutrinos in general. And so maybe we need some other tweak to the standard model. So of course, though, you have to replicate experiments in physics. And so to settle the question, they built an even smaller experiment with only 170 tons of liquid argon called micro boom. Uh, and so this has been running uh, for a while, I think about six years now. And so far, microboon has not replicated what mini boon has seen. It has not seen muon neutrinos turning into electron neutrinos too fast. There probably are sources of noise that afflicted the original experiment that render it, its results uh, invalid, probably. But we don't know for sure. 
So as you can see, this type of work is takes a lot of expertise. There are like hundreds of people involved in each of these type of experiments and they go on for decades. And it's all about trying to find tiny little cracks in the standard model or um, things, yeah, or, uh, or fix them. So now let me switch away from the standard model to general relativity. So general relativity, which I'm not going to summarize in much detail, says this amazing thing that really falling objects, throw a rock in the air, are actually tracing out paths in space time that are as straight as possible. Now, at first, you should say that's ridiculous. If I throw a rock in the air, that's as straight as possible. It should be going straight. But it turns out that's because you're just looking at space, my friend. You should be looking at space time. And it's also moving very rapidly forward in time. And if you think about it that way, it's just ever so slightly deviating from being straight. It's going as straight as possible, given the fact that space time is slightly curved by the gravity of the Earth. Matter in general relativity curves space time in a manner described by Einstein's equation. Now, you probably heard different kind of uh, stories about general relativity. It's full of interesting things. But one thing that people tend not to talk about when they're explaining general relativity to the, to the public is Einstein's equation. That was actually the key thing, actually, uh, the specific equation that says how matter occurs space time. So just to break from tradition, I'm going to show you a version of Einstein's equation. So I figure every talk about physics or math should have at least like one intimidating portion here so that you like feel that you're in the presence of someone who actually knows what they're talking about. <laughs> uh, so this is that this is that this is that portion. I mean, I could have intimidated you more by writing it in the usual notation, which is like absolutely incomprehensible, but I thought I'd try to explain it. Um, so it still won't make sense, so I, it'll be okay. But uh, uh, but anyway, here it is. So <laughs> translated into words, if you have a small ball of freely falling particles that are very light themselves, so we call them test particles. So we're not worrying about how they affect gravity, we're just seeing how they're falling. And if they're initially at rest relative to each other, meaning they're all moving at the same speed in the same direction, it turns out that this ball will not stay the same size in general because space time is curved. And the rate at which this volume of this ball starts to shrink depends on some stuff. It depends on the density of energy in the middle of the ball, which is this number here, plus the sum of the pressures in all three directions, which are these numbers here. Now, maybe you're used to thinking about pressure as not depending on the direction, but if you like squish a book like this, then there's actually like more pressure in this direction than in the other direction. So pressure can depend on direction. Uh, and so you add those up, you multiply by some minus sign because of and a half just for kicks uh, to make to describe that the, the, the more of this stuff is, the more the thing's going to shrink. And this is the rate of shrinkage, or more precisely, like the, the second derivative of the volume of the ball divided by the volume. So this is a formulation of Einstein's equation that you don't usually see in textbooks, but can be translated into the form that you usually do see. So it's just a quantitative description of how things moving, uh, how things freely uh, falling, how their paths actually uh, bend because space time is curved. Remarkably, from this equation, you can understand lots of things. First of all, how, why masses attract in the first place, which are what Newton's theory of gravity was all about, but then also sort of new stuff like black holes, uh, gravitational waves, meaning if a large object like a star is moving around and around, it actually creates waves of curvature of space time. And the Big Bang, the fact that the whole universe is, ex is expanding. And if you trace it back far enough in time, it seems as if it all was infinitely compressed past a certain point. So all of this emerged out of Einstein's theory. And in particular, if you assume that the pressure in the space between galaxies is zero or very, very close to zero, you can solve Einstein's equations and get three different possibilities for what happens to the universe as time goes by. So this here is a graph where T, this axis is time, and R here means 
say the distance between two very far away galaxies, which you use, you track that distance as a way to tell whether the universe is expanding or, or contracting. And one possibility is that the universe expands for a while and then recollapses. This here is called the Big Bang. It's where the, everything is, in, is right next to each other. So the distance between your distance, gal distant galaxies has gone down to zero. And in this scenario, there's a big crunch far in the future. Um, there's an other scenario where the universe keeps on expanding forever. And then there's a kind of borderline scenario called the critical scenario where it does keep on expanding forever, but slower and slower and slower. So those were three possibilities that were figured out uh, shortly after Einstein came up with this theory of general relativity. And then when Edwin Hubble observed that distant galaxies were in fact moving away from us, uh, it was considered to be confirmation of this. And then the big question just was, which of these three scenarios are we in? And the answer is neither, none of them. None of them matches what we actually see. Because if people examine things more carefully with modern telescopes and telescopes on uh, satellites, it turns out that it seems the universe is expanding faster and faster as time goes on, not like any of these possibilities. Um, so big question, one of the big questions in fundamental physics today is what's making that happen? Um, one possibility could be that the vacuum does have pressure. The vacuum, the space between the galaxies actually has non-zero pressure. But if so, why does it have that? And then of course, if not, then something else has got to be going on. What's that? So the most popular opinion on this issue right now, because it's the most conservative scenario, is actually that the vacuum does have pressure. Weirdly, it needs to have negative pressure and positive density to make the universe expand faster and faster. That would take a while to explain, but it's true. So uh, to get the accelerated expansion to match what we see, you need just a tiny amount of density of the, the vacuum. It just needs to be seven times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, almost nothing, per cubic meter. But because the space between galaxies is so huge, that adds up to actually have noticeable effects. So this theory of what's going on often these days goes by the name of dark energy. So if you've ever heard about dark energy, that's this idea that the vacuum has, uh, has negative pressure and positive density. A better name than dark energy has been proposed, which I haven't caught on, because dark energy sounds so cool, it is invisible tension. Because dark energy is not black or anything like that. <clears throat> it's just transparent. You just can't see it at all. And this negative pressure, another name for negative pressure is tension. So like if you have a spring, it's pulling in, that's tension, negative pressure. So uh, I, I noticed there's some, there's some rock group put out an album called Invisible Tension. So at least it's caught on a little bit. Uh, and there are other mysteries of gravity, which seem very hard to solve, which I'm just listing as like examples of questions that probably we're, we're stuck on. Uh, really, key one I already mentioned is how can we reconcile general relativity with the standard model, which is, describes all the other forces? As I mentioned, general relativity ignores quantum mechanics. The standard model does not. They, they've got to fit together. We probably need a theory of, of gravity that does take quantum <clears throat> mechanics into account. Another obvious one is what really happened at the Big Bang? Was there really a moment when everything became infinitely compressed? Or when maybe when you get really close to that moment, something else happens that we don't know what it is. Uh, was there anything before the Big Bang? We don't know. What happens to stuff that falls into black holes? Does it just go in there and just disappear forever? Or does it like eventually maybe the black hole evaporates and the stuff pops out in some form? Uh, we don't know. And what's the ultimate fate of the universe? That'd be good to know. Uh, I'll just get it over with here. Um, so, like watching a TV show, you only want to know what's going to happen. Well, we don't know what's going to happen. If you, if by our best theory so far, the accelerating expansion of the universe will just pull everything further and further apart. So, eventually, every atom 
will be so far away from every other atom that there's like no form of communication between atoms anymore, and it will become extremely boring. Uh, um, which, uh, but we don't know that that's true. I mean, this that's our best theory now, but it could be that like 50 years from now we'll say, ha ha ha, that's what they thought back then, those idiots. So we don't know. Um, and another really great question is why is the future so different than the past? As you've no doubt noticed, if you drop an egg, it goes, but there's no way to like unsplat it and have it pop back up into your hand, except by like making a movie of it and playing the movie backward. Uh, the laws of physics don't seem to completely prohibit that from happening. We tend to say, oh, that's extremely improbable because everything has to be perfectly lined up to pop up into your hand like that. But that's a weak argument because in fact, everything had to be perfectly lined up at the beginning so that it would drop and splat. Uh, so it's, we, there's a, some asymmetry between the future and the past that we don't fully understand. A lot of people trace it back to the Big Bang, but even then it's not explained, it's just being traced back to that. So all those are too hard. It seems easier to make progress on other problems. One other last big problem that I wanna mention that we can make some progress on is this. Why don't galaxies or the early hot gas in the universe behave the way we would expect? Why do we seem to need some extra kind of matter, invisible, what we call it dark matter, or maybe a new theory of gravity? You see, there are a lot of funny things going on. Galaxies all rotate much faster than we would expect given the amount of mass we see them having. The more mass is in something, the more it makes things, it attracts things gravitationally. So the more things around it spin around, and gravity, the galaxies are all spinning around faster than we would expect. Uh, and in the early universe, galaxies form faster than we would expect, uh, unless we say, oh, there's like extra mass there that, oh, in some form that we don't understand. Or maybe gravity doesn't work the way we thought. And thirdly, fluctuations, little ripples, density in the hot gas of the very early universe are more lumpy than we would expect, given the amount of mass that's around that tends to like collapse into lumps. So, um, yeah, so all of these are currently uh, people attempt to explain them by positing new forms of matter called dark matter that, that don't interact with matter in ways except from gravity, or at least not much, uh, and that we don't really know what it is. It's not apparently not a particle in the standard model. Uh, the more rebellious alternative is to suggest that our theories of gravity are, are messed up and we need to adjust those. So there are also people trying to do that, fix our theories of gravity in a way to account for all this. So the good thing about this is that astrophysicists are learning a lot about this by doing lots of different kinds of observations. So it's a subject where we keep getting new clues. So this is sort of old by the contemporary rapid pace standards. This is called the bullet cluster. It's two large clusters of galaxies imaged in sort of some fake color here to indicate some things that are going on. And the idea is that these two clusters of galaxies crashed into each other and went through each other. And the visible matter, which is indicated by this bluish stuff, because, because galaxies are clusters of galaxies, their density is so low, it just plowed straight through and did not, didn't really mind, it just went straight through. Whereas the dark matter, which is indicated by this pink stuff, did crash into to it, itself and slow down. And that's why it doesn't go, it hasn't gone far enough away. They've already gone through each other, now they're leaving. How the heck do you have a picture of dark matter? It looks like pink, not dark. Uh, it, it's because what we do is we measure how the light of, of galaxies behind this got bent by the force of gravity. So we estimate the amount of, of matter that should be there bending. And that this, that that, and if there's no visible matter there, we say, oh, maybe that's dark matter. So this has often been uh, trumpeted as like a definitive proof that dark matter is really there. Um, but people who believe in alternative theories of gravity actually have their own ways of trying to explain even this type of occurrence. So it's, I would say it's really definitive. Okay, so now it's time to summarize. So we've come to this talk about 
mysteries of fundamental physics, and you're going to walk off and you're going to read news stories occasionally, and you're going to wonder, like, okay, any progress yet on any of these mysteries? And so, in this summary, I want to give you a little bit of advice for what to do in your future uh, read consuming of information about uh, fundamental physics. This is assuming, of course, you're not a professional physicist, in which case, perfectly well what you want to do, and you don't need any advice, but I'll give it to you anyway. So don't hold your breath. It's the first key piece of advice. So the progress has been very slow since 1980 compared to like from 1900 to 1980. And because of this slowness, and because newspapers have to keep selling newspapers, uh, there's a lot of churn that winds up not mattering. Now. So I would suggest if you don't pay too much attention to cool sounding theories that don't have experimental evidence. For example, there's been a whole huge discussion about something called the multiverse in the last 10 years. This is not the metaverse, which is like some other thing. Uh, the multiverse is the idea that they're like many multiple realities. Um, so basically there's no way to obtain experimental evidence for that. And it's basically the kind of thing that physicists talk about when there isn't anything better to talk about. <laughs> um, and I, I, this is a tougher piece of advice to give, but I also suggest not paying too much attention to surprising experimental results unless they've been confirmed. Of course, experimental results are what we really need, and that's how we're actually making progress now. So I'm not saying like ignore experimental results. It's that people are so hungry for, for new experimental results in physics that whenever there's some little deviation in some particle detector somewhere, that something is like, oh, three standard deviations away from what you expect, you will see articles in the science press saying like, oh, maybe the standard model has finally been proven wrong. And so far, although I see like about five such stories a year, so far for the last, say, I don't know, five or 10 years, they've all not panned out. So just wait until something is confirmed. Don't worry, if we really discover something, you'll hear about it. <laughs> so I suggest on the other hand, that it is good to stay tuned for news about these three things I mentioned, neutrino oscillations, dark energy, and dark matter. And the reason why, because these are mysteries where experiments and observations, uh, astrophysical observations, keep turning up new clues. So this is like a fun story to keep following, where it's like a detective story where we keep finding new clues. And it's interesting that these three questions are related to what makes things have mass. The neutrino oscillations are currently explained by the Higgs boson, which is the mysterious particle that makes everything have its have mass or well, fundamental part of mass. And what makes space-time bend? That is, uh, is it are there new forms of energy and matter which are curving space-time, so we just don't know what they are, or is our theory of gravity screwed up slightly? Uh, and that may be the explanation for what we're currently calling dark energy and dark matter. So these are things that we're going to slowly uh, make progress on because we've got such great uh, observational astronomers and experimental particle physicists working away on them. And so we're eventually going to have some new breakthrough, but I have no idea when it's going to be. So it's good to just like sit back, get out of your popcorn, uh, watch the movies and read, and read physics books because the amount of physics that we already know is amazing, and it's so much fun to learn. You don't even really need new fundamental physics. Most of us don't really need new fundamental physics to keep uh, entertained. There's a lot to learn here, and I've just skimmed over the surface of it. Okay, thanks very much.